Okay, well, everyone, welcome back. We're excited to have day three of the conference. Again, hoping that this has worked out well for all of you, speakers and participants, together in doing this spanned over three days and really just doing a couple hours per day rather than one straight day or so to minimize the Zoom fatigue. So today we have a great lineup, three panels uh, to uh, kick you off on a great Friday and then for your weekend. First panel today is going to be the power of data ownership and analytics. We saw in the last couple of days, so many references to data and we're so fortunate to have a great panel that Sean Pager will run for us on digging deeper into data, where it comes from, how it gets owned and controlled. And then we'll have a short break. And then the second session of the day is artist management and the business of music. Again, this is the music ecosystem conference, not just about copyright, but about the whole ecosystem, how we manage artists and how we think about the business of music overall. And then finally, the last session today, supporting artists and communities just couldn't be more important, especially with COVID and everything going on. How are we gonna support the mental and physical health of our great artists? So I don't wanna take up too much time. I wanna hand over to my good friend, Sean Pager, who's at Michigan State University, has been a great friend to our program for years, has done great work with his own Creative Upstarts program. And so I just couldn't say more about him, except that Sean, just like Richard Bush yesterday, that is not an accurate depiction of San Francisco today from the Marin Headlands, but. <laughs> All right, you called me out, Sean. Take it away, Hi. Sean. And thanks to uh, CPIP for organizing this amazing conference. Those of you listening yesterday's um, panel on uh, record labels already heard several speakers testify to the importance of data in today's music industry and the volume of data, the sheer uh, uh, richness of the information available. And today's panelists uh, will expand on this theme and explore some broader implications. So um, they say data is the new petroleum of the digital economy. Like petroleum, data has to be refined or analyzed to unlock its value. And there are lots of legal issues instead of subterranean drilling rights. Um, think about uh, navigating access, ownership, privacy, security, uh, logistical issues. Instead of pipelines and oil freighters, we have issues about metadata, interoperability. Um, anyway, before I get tarred and feathered by pushing my petroleum metaphor any further, uh, let me turn it over to our fabulous panelists. You have their bios in the programs, so I'll just introduce them briefly in the order they'll be speaking. Uh, we have Sarona Elton from University of Miami, Josh Friedlander from the RIAA, Jake Linford from uh, Florida State University, uh, and Tanya Evans, from Pennsylvania Dickinson. And um, last will be Will Page, uh, now at LS London School of Economics, um, formerly Spotify. So um, Serona, over to you. All right, hello. Okay, so I am going to just share a brief uh, slide so you can follow along with what I'm gonna talk about. So let me go ahead and do that. Okay, and I'll ask my fellow panelists, give me the thumbs up if you're all good, you can see that okay? Fantastic. Okay, so um, nice to meet you all. Um, so what I wanna do is um, take a minute actually, um, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. Um, you guys still, still see my slides, right? Nothing has changed, thumbs up? Okay, thanks. So um, I want to start off actually with um, a short quote that really caught me. Um, the quote is, uh, the price of light is less than the cost of darkness. Um, and that's attributed to Arthur C. Nielsen, the market researcher and founder of A.C. Nielsen. Um, and I thought that that, uh, that was particularly on point. Um, so in case you were not aware until now, <laughs> data matters a lot to content creators, owners, and administrators. I'd like to briefly walk you through the different data analytics tools that are available to recording artists today. Um, these are available to any artist, regardless of whether they are signed to a label or not. Some of these are free and some require a subscription, but I've included them because the cost of the subscription is in the range of something that an up and coming artist might be able to afford. So um, first on my list is Spotify for artists. Um, so if I was gonna 
look at the way the data is presented by Spotify for Artists, I would put it into three categories. Um, the first is data about content consumption. So the number of streams, the trends of how those streams have gone up and gone down over time, the location where the streams are happening, top locations, top countries, top cities. Um, so that's content consumption information about the content itself. Um, content discovery information would be the second category, and that's information about the source of streams. Um, how did the consumer end up on that track? Was it because they searched? Did they get there from the artist's profile page? Did they get there because of a playlist? Um, how many different playlists has the track been added to? Um, and then the third category would be audience <clears throat> audience demographics. And by that, we mean age, gender, also location um, of the listeners. Um, so that kind of information is available to verified artists um, on the Spotify for Artists platform. Um, second up, we have, as you might have guessed, Apple Music for Artists. Um, so uh, the data is frankly very similar. Um, I will just say there's an article on Hypebot uh, that appeared about a year ago by a music marketer named Jay Gilbert. He compared the features of both of these. Um, and in his opinion, he said that Spotify has the most individual metrics while Apple has the most flexibility for user generated reports and comparisons. So third on the list is Pandora's artist marketing platform, abbreviated AMP, AMP for short, um, combined with Next Big Sound. So in 2015, Pandora bought Next Big Sound, a well-established music industry analytics company. And by the way, not long before that, as part of a trend of music platforms buying analytics companies, Spotify bought Echo Nest and Apple bought Symmetric, which was the company behind Music Metric. Um, so Pandora allows an artist to claim their profile on the platform, then create an account on Next Big Sound and connect the two. And by the way, anybody can create an account on Next Big Sound for free and check out some stats about your favorite artist. Um, and so uh, this also includes a lot of data like what I've described already, but it also includes some social media um, information as well. Next up is YouTube for artists. Um, so again, similar in concept to the things we discussed already, but it also taps you into YouTube analytics for your videos and for your channel, which shows a lot of detailed information. Um, and it includes uh, information about the traffic sources on YouTube, but also external sites where that YouTube video may be embedded. So, um, so that's uh, an, another really powerful tool. Chart metric, now we move into the category of um, a tool that is not connected to any one single platform. So there is a free version of chart metric. There's also paid versions with more features. Um, chart metric includes there from more than 25 different music streaming services, as well as social media sources all in one place. So there is a real benefit to an artist seeing information come together rather than going um, to specific platforms. Um, the, another cool thing about this is that the, the person that signed up with Chartmetrics can see data about more than just a single artist. They can see it across many, many artists. Um, and also you could check out the free version of that. Um, lastly on this list um, is sound charts. Um, some might consider chart metric and sound charts to be co competitors. Um, this also provides data from multiple sources, including socials, websites, and radio airplay um, of more than 1,700 AM FM stations. Same thing as chart metric, you can see data from more than just a single artist. And then the last thing I want to talk about briefly is um, I've been asked to comment a little bit on um, the kind of data that might be available to artists or songwriters um, through a collective management organization. So as most of you watching already know, certain types of rights in musical works and sound recordings are typically managed by a collective rights management organization, most typically public performance rights, or mechanical rights, or neighboring rights digital performance rights in, in sound recordings. Surely you're all familiar with names like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR, Sound Exchange, PPL, PRS for Music, and most recently, the Mechanical Licensing Collective, the MLC. Um, all of these organizations have responsibility for paying royalties to rights holders, and as part of that, for providing some sort of royalty statement, if you will. Um, so how much data is on these royalty statements or is made available with on-screen analytics um, or, and or the ability to download those transactional data so that you can analyze them in whatever tool you like. 
that varies. Um, the same could be said for uh, large record companies and music publishers who also now um, mostly, I think all of them at this point have online royalties portals. Um, the topic of royalties transparency, um, especially in the context of a CMO is for another day. Um, but and factors like uh, governmental regulation and competition in the marketplace um, can dictate and influence uh, how transparent CMOs are. Um, but generally speaking, the data that is provided to an artist um, or a songwriter is going to include information such as the work or recording album title, the type of activity, the territory in which it occurred, the month or quarter when it occurred, and the royalties due. Um, it might go deeper in listing the licensee, um, the party that that service, um, sorry, that that CMO licensed and received the data reporting from, but it's unlikely to go deeper than that down to the consumer level in the way that the other services I talked about can, um, because that consumer level information generally doesn't have any bearing on royalty reporting and much of this data provided through from a CMO is about royalty reporting. Um, usage reporting. So the more granular the data, the more useful it is in terms of business intelligence. So for example, knowing that some form of music usage um, happened at a, in a certain city is better than just knowing about it at a country level, um, but knowing about it at a country level is better than no geographic information at all. So um, that's the end of my brief overview. Um, I will now turn it back over to our moderator. Okay. Well, thanks, Serona, for those very helpful initial remarks. Um, so now we'll be turning to uh, Josh Friedlander, who from the uh, recording industry, who will talk a little bit about uh, data, I guess he uses in his job, and um, more generally record labels and uh, people in the recording industry. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, thank you for joining us uh, on this panel. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of data and some insights from what we're doing with that data. Um, I'm also realizing I'm not, I'm the only one on the panel who can't say professor or doctor in their name. So I really better bring something good to share. Um, I, since it's a data panel, I think we do actually have to share some data. So give me a moment. Let me, um, share a slide, uh, for everyone. And, uh, I hope you all can see this. So just, I wanted to talk, start by talking about this scale of data that we are talking about today. Um, Way back in the 1990s, uh, sales tracking started to become computerized. And the only data that was really available was for sales. And before that, the data was even less well tracked. It was apparently a series of people making phone calls to each other. Uh, and somehow they came up with charts. Um, now, in the biggest years in the 1990s, we're talking about tracking maybe a billion fan transactions a year. That's buying a CD, buying a cassette, buying a single. That sounds like a really big number, I know. Um, but that's why I wanted to share this data. Um, in the 20 years since then, in two decades, we've moved to now one and a half trillion, that's trillion with a T, uh, transactions that we're uh, measuring every single year. And this is just in the United States. This is a measure, this is mostly, of course, the number of streams that are being tracked, but we also know who listened to them, when, for how long, and on which service. Um, so I want everybody to understand that the scale of data is not a little bigger. It's literally a thousand times bigger than it was really not that long ago. Um, it's very easy to get lost in the numbers. So I, I'm hoping we can do this visual to, to provide some perspective. Um, everyone, I, I hope everyone got a chance to see that panel yesterday where they were talking about uh, what labels are doing, uh, what labels and platforms are able to do with that data. Um, the ability to identify emerging artists, find hit songs, amplify them, um, designing tours around fan geography, uh, reaching specific fans uh, through social media, helping artists find their fan base. All of these things are done completely differently today uh, from how they were 20 years ago or so. I'm gonna stop sharing that slide for a second. Um, so I wanna give some examples of those insights. Um, in the 1990s uh, and even in the early 2000s, when we were tracking what people bought, if you looked at the mix between uh, new releases purchased and catalog purchase, it was about a 60-40 mix. 60% 60 of sales were new release and 40% uh, was catalog. Over time, we've been able to measure not just what people are buying, but actually today we can see what they're actually listening to on those streaming services. And of course, those numbers have completely flipped. Now, more than 60% of consumption we see is uh, based is going to be catalog material 
and 40% is new release. I don't think this means that people are listening differently. I just think we're doing a better job of tracking it. We used to only track the initial transaction, but now we're seeing all of the behavior that's involved. So I think this is a great example of, this, this is the surface of what we can do um, when we look at these reams of data. Um, I get to work very closely with people at the labels who work on big releases and uh, help artists with their marketing plans. Um, they recall times, if you said the words demographic targeting, audience analysis, ARPU, uh, you got kicked out of the meeting because they were dirty words. Uh, and now those are part of every single marketing plan. If you don't have that, you don't have a, a fully fledged marketing plan. Now this ties back to uh, what Serona was talking about and all this data being available for artists. And it's fantastic that all this data is available, but I think one of, one of the key things to remember is that, you know, artists did not usually pick up a guitar uh, or learn how to sing because they want to pour through 200 page royalty statements uh, and go through reams and reams of data. And by the way, sometimes those royalty statements are in other languages too. So there are a lot of challenges in dealing with that. Um, and this is what ties into what we were saying with labels. Um, all these tools are available, but you really need a team to help you take advantage of them. You need specialists to go all through this. And it's very, very hard to, to go it alone these days. Um, and what we want is we want artists to be focusing on making the music and not having to spend so much time uh, focusing on royalty statements. Um, there's some other insights I want to share uh, that we get from, from studying fans. Um, we look at survey data, we look at actual consumption data, uh, we do focus groups. So we have a lot of opportunities to, to really talk to them. And uh, one of the things that we think a lot about is the transformation of the industry over the last few decades from a, from a purchase model to then a downloading model and now, and now this, this access model. And I think you hear a lot of people describing it as kind of a cannibalization. You know, people move from one to another. Are they gonna stream or are they gonna buy? And I think one of the surprising things that we found from talking to uh, a lot of music fans is that that is not the right way to think about it. Um, that is thinking about it from the business side out to the fans. And if we have the opportunity to listen to the fans, we see that they're actually doing everything. Uh, people who pay for subscription services and believe it or not, there are people who pay for more than one subscription service. You know, having access to Amazon Unlimited isn't enough. They also need Spotify or they also need Apple. Um, they also are the ones who are buying vinyl. They're the ones who are listening to songs on YouTube. They're the ones who uh, put on Pandora in the background. And they're the ones who, for the next thing, are probably going to be listening to songs on TikTok uh, and uh, following live streams on Twitch. Um, so I think this is just an example of how we can turn this around and see the world from the fans point of view uh, and rather rather than just uh, the industry's point of view. So um, one one last item I want to share. I'd be remiss if I didn't know that yesterday we released our, our mid year 2020 revenue data and I encourage everybody to read to read the report. I hope we provide a lot of great insight. Um, but this is, you know, one more example of how we're using data in uh, w the way we describe the industry. I'm going to put his, uh, the, the slides back on for a second and hopefully this will advance. There we go. Um, so I want, just wanted to share how this uh, has changed through the years and, and just as another example of how um, not just the formats but how we describe the industry has changed through the years. So in the 70s of course we're just tracking a few um, just a few formats in the 90s, we started adding CDs and then 2000s digital. And now in 2020, you know, I have the major categories listed here, but we're actually tracking data across dozens of formats and pulling all of this together. So what used to be a very simple job has actually become very, very complicated. But at the same time, I think we're providing a lot more information uh, than what used to be available. Um, so uh, I hope this is helping shed some light on what's happening in the business. I'm going to stop here and I'm happy to uh, discuss more if we come back for questions afterwards. Okay, well, thank you, Josh. Very illuminating presentation. Um, I forgot to say earlier, um, to those of you listening, um, we're of course going to have a question and answer session um, with the time at the end of the session. And uh, anybody with questions can feel free to send them to the panelists uh, via the chat function. Just uh, to post your questions on chat and I will try to compile these questions and ask them as time permits um, at the end of the, after the initial presentations. Okay, so um, next up we'll have Jake Linford, who will say a little bit about, I believe, streaming platforms, use of data there.
Well, a little bit. So my, my job is a little bit to be the little black rain cloud, unfortunately. And I'll ask my panelists, can you see my slides? Are they showing? Good. Um, I think you've heard uh, today from Josh and Sharona, yesterday from Garrett Levin with Dima, lots of the upside of data analytics. And I want to flag a couple of costs that I think we may want to keep in mind. Uh, first, is it possible and sometimes problematic that gathering all this data about music consumers might reveal potentially sensitive information about them? Second, uh, is it possible that the data gathering reshapes popular music and are we accounting for that? Are we happy with that result? And is it possible that there are costs to increasingly data-driven creation? I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, here's a study of Spotify. Spotify is not alone in this. Platforms often gather data and then share it with quote unquote service providers and others. And who are the others? Now you might say to me, well, why do I care whether Spotify or any other platform shares my data? Well, here's a couple of potential why we might care. Netflix did a study, tell us what you can tell us from Netflix data, and then was promptly sued by an in the closet lesbian mother that the study had revealed basically that she was a, a, a homosexual based on her consumption. A couple of clever guys from Texas, you know, had run the study and found out some things about her that I don't think she anticipated Netflix would reveal about her when she started using the platform. Uh, six years ago, the Wall Street Journal reported that Pandora thinks it knows if you're a Republican. Now there's some utility to some of this data. You know, I might want to reach out to audiences of a number of, of different sexual uh, gender orientations. I might want to reach out to my Republican or Democratic listeners. Um, but there's also a potential cost uh, to having this data gathered and then distributed. Uh, all of these platforms are consuming information about us and then repurposing those and Look, you know, the typical way lawyers advise firms to structure their privacy notices are to provide the firms with lots of discretion and to provide the users with perhaps less information and less clear information than they might otherwise prefer. Um, now, Josh has already talked, Saron has already talked about data-driven music touring, a famous story attributed to Spotify CEO Daniel Leck that suggested Metallica was making set list decisions city by city based on Spotify data. That can be pretty valuable. There is a potential cost here that we want to think about, which is whose views are we counting? So in a paper from Josh Lerman in 2013, he suggested, look, people who exist on big data's periphery and don't get counted, then they don't get accounted for. Now that's not necessarily a change in measuring. You know, Tom Petty told us, you know, 30 years ago, it was about whether the ANR man could hear a single or not. Uh, you know, we've relied on Nielsen, we've relied on lots of different measuring tools, but as you change your measurements and as you rely more on firms that engage in data aggregators, we may be leaving out some subset of consumers and we want to think carefully about that perhaps. Uh, just for an example, here's Spotify's consumption, a uh, report on Spotify consumption. 22% uh, of U.S. consumers report using it weekly, 25% monthly. And the bigger a firm gets, the more data they've got. But then, of course, the bigger the firm gets, and that is a potential um, issue to consider. Here's another one. Does the data sometimes shape the creativity? So in a paper by Cal Raustiella and, and Chris Sprigman from a couple of years ago, they said, look, uh, and if you're not familiar with the platform, Pornhub is a platform for consuming pornography. Uh, and they've gotten so much data, they've started to make some predictions about how porn films ought to be put together. Netflix is doing some of the same sorts of things. Uh, Amazon, you know, a platform for sellers then gathers data that they use to launch competing products to some of their sellers. There is potentially a question as to whether a platform like Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music, etc. could gather some data and become their own record label. Now, to date, that's been disclaimed, although a couple of years ago, uh, Spotify did hire uh, Francois Pache, who uh, is the head of their creator technology research lab, and a gentleman who said, look, I think maybe I can take an algorithm and make a pretty good approximation of a Beatles song. I'm going to play a little bit of this for you, uh, just so you can kind of hear. I'm going to say it's really probably more, you know, mid-tier ELO than Beatles. 
But the point is, if the data gets good enough, if the data gets good enough, it's possible, plausible, that there could be a shift to data-driven creation instead of artist-driven creation. Is that necessarily a net negative? I'm not sure. There are some rumors that Spotify was doing this in seeding fake artists, and I think that speaks to the concern. Whether it speaks to the reality or not, I'm not sure yet. I think what it suggests, though, is firms probably owe to their consumers some sort of accounting about how they're using the data, who it gets passed off to, and what can and can't be done with it, uh, so that we keep some of these costs in mind. So I'm, I raise these concerns so we can kind of think about those potential costs. Anyway, look forward to the Q&A period. Okay, Jake. Always good to think about costs as well as benefits. Um, Maybe under my petroleum metaphor, these are the oil slicks of the data economy. Um, anyway, uh, let's move on to our next presentation and um, hear from Tanya. Thank Talking you. Watching. Excellent. Slides up. I can get going in class and otherwise and, and seven slides in before I know it. Thank you so much for the presentations that came before and I love the synergy uh, of the order. Um, and certainly the info privacy concerns um, are not lost on me as I delve into an overview and, and I'm happy to take the questions uh, after about the role that uh, the, uh, the disintermediation that can occur with a different way to organize uh, data in a centralized rather than siloed fashion. So uh, when I speak of disintermediation, the goal in 2009 when Satoshi, whoever he, she, or they are, uh, released the first um, stable blockchain for the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, that is a story for another day. You can go to prop, proptanyaevans.com if you want to get a, a primer on, on blockchain. But one of the um, most important aspects of it and, and the potential and the power in the space of music is removing some of the friction points because it's so heavily um, intermediated. I think I just made up a word, but the point of so many stop points along the way, um, the, um, we're all familiar, I think, with the process of from music creation to distribution and all of the stop points all, along the way. You have your content creators and producers, you have uh, recording studios, each one of these, um, entities or individuals has their own method and means of storing data, transitions to agents and managers and pros, marketing, distribution, production, um, pressing of um, back in the day vinyl or CDs or in some way um, creating for dissemination and then further dissemination. And then we have the environment of concerts and um, certainly media, both traditional and uh, new media, which is now the traditional media. The new media is now the old media and we are uh, moving forward even more. And of course we see all of the friction points, stops along the way and the premiums that are extracted uh, as well. The point of it all obviously is to find trusted parties where you have two uh, entities or individuals who do not know each other and need to find a trust point, but are those trust points now turning into the trope points that have uh, even, um, uh, become pervasive in digital, digital distribution as well. There was a lot of power and promise in the 90s as people talked about the internet and digital technology and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and what that would do to completely upend the music industry and the, the industry certainly took a hit. But what we've seen emerge are new um, stop points, friction points even, and especially in the digital medium. So what were some of the problems in the space, the Internet of Information, also known as Web 2.0? We had this free exchange of ideas, but uh, it failed to account for and to control um, digital ownership, property rights. The content was easily created, but also easily pirated. Uh, the unauthorized copyist in his or her fuzzy slippers at home could send and disseminate. We all know the story and the tales of all of the uh, problems and concerns, but obviously making it difficult or impossible to distinguish masters from copies and not, um, uh, not distinguishing the copy from the uh, master caused epic problems where the 
technology was so great that the degradation that we experienced with cassettes, for example, were no longer uh, took place. That translates into um, certainly issues of who controls data under what circumstance, data being the new petroleum to be sure. If data is the new oil, then uh, the problems and concerns that Jake uh, raise certainly uh, rear their head here as well, and also impact the ability of creators to participate in secondary markets in any meaningful way. Uh, I was known as lawyer by day, poet by night some time ago, and every time I check into CD Baby and see my royalties that are one cent, two cent, negative cents, I don't know, but I know that it's trapped somewhere and it's very difficult to get that information um, and the necessary payments. We heard a bit about meta metadata from Serona area uh, earlier, and there have been a number of blockchain projects who have tried to solve for this problem, uh, but the uh, competitiveness never gave way to the cooperation necessary to share even the most basic minimal viable data. We've seen some things happen on the legislative front to try and move and advance that forward, but there have been a number of private uh, entities, I can think of like .vc and some of the other um, earlier things in the blockchain space that didn't really take hold. But uh, the problems of payments might be solved by um, a disaggregated, decentralized system of blockchain, also powered by smart contracts. Neither smart nor contract people often say, but it really is bits of code that automate certain um, functions that might be automated. One of the best is in the payments um, environment, because we have this issue of um, a current lack of intrinsic scarcity. There's also uh, um, a number of initiatives based on certain token standards in the blockchain and crypto um, asset space of creating non-fungible tokens. So fungible meaning that uh, one would be interchangeable with another on the NFT or non-fungible token side, creating a unique either purely uh, and natively digital asset, um, and some projects are doing that, or tokenizing real world assets has um, a number of problems, but a number of possibilities uh, as well. But this idea of programmable money on the side of cryptocurrency could also be translated to crypto assets that may have some secondary um, value or benefits, but also and primarily might be used to serve the purpose of for example, um, connecting artists to their fan base in a really interesting and unique way. And it's that non-fungible or NFT token standard that might be the bridge um, to cure the issue one of digital scarcity, because you're one and done, it's easily verifiable, and trace, excuse me, traceable. So there may be a better way. I should have a, a huge question mark over the sign. Uh, but some of the benefits in the space, and we'll talk about it more um, in the uh, chat that follows, but the idea of blockchain being immutable um, if you have a pure public permissionless chain in a permissioned consortium that um, you might have the power to roll back certain things, but preventing forgery and theft directly goes to the value that might be offered in this type of environment. Um, verification, logging on the blockchain or recording, another way of saying recording bits of information about files rather than complete file storage. Uh, blockchains are not well suited for that, although there are other projects to support it. And again, the tokenization of real world assets, but the automated performance of smart contracts to facilitate payments um, and also to address the siloed data uh, problem of course, it's um, you know garbage in, garbage out, and we're always going to have that concern, and that uh, leads to some of the things that Jake shared as well. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to highlight some of these things and skip to a couple of slides at the end, but I am um, certainly willing to share these slides, and, and we'll make that happen in some other forum. But when we think about the power of blockchain, we think about the internet of value, moving from the internet of information to value, so that uh, you have this digital method, this digital spreadsheet that is distributed so it's not run by one entity, one person. You have the disaggregation of, of uh, control over data that actually is very empowering. And you can do not just financial transactions, but anything of value when you have this decentralized database that is maintained by a network of computers, again, rather than one siloed um, entity or intermediary. And that um, brings additional value when the trust is in the code and not in any one individual. 
Um, and this is what, when we think of the, the digital uh, revolution or evolution to full distribution, I don't know if we'll see that in my lifetime, but the method of we're really sitting in the middle of that with some decentralization, but otherwise uh, siloed intermediaries, we think of the bangs of the world. Um, and the problems that have resulted with new intermediaries and the same issue. The final um, couple of points, when I'm talking about the technology, we're focusing on technology that isn't new, but was created and assembled in a novel way. We think of peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, so that was certainly disintermediation, the power uh, of the internet and public-private key cryptography and digital signature, making the focus on one and done, um, and you can have the ability to uh, have one spend, not a double spend, and that has a lot of power and promise. Um, going to the, uh, what I'd like to share is the use cases in the music industry. We've always, uh, we've seen some discussions about this decentralized global digital rights database. Um, whether that can ever happen, it, it may be a pie in the sky dream. But the idea of at least having a method of in a decentralized fashion so that that would be more um, egalitarian in terms of people being able to access it and also creating artist um, autonomy. DRM is something that we have a lot of um, legal fences up that might be uh, solved in this area. Automatic uh, royalty payments, uh, fundraising projects. Uh, we have securities concerns there, but assuming they're following all safety guidelines. And the idea, finally, of permission data sharing consortia. They have crashed and burned in the past. I'm hoping that at some point we'll get this right. Uh, but there's power and promise in that as well. And with that, I'll um, pause and uh, hand it over. And we can talk about some other things on the other side. OK, thanks, Tanya. And um, last but not least, we'll turn it over to Will Page. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to speak to everybody today. And thanks for the great presentations we've had, just a few comments on each. Um, firstly, uh, I think Jake referred to AI, just kind of funny point there. The Financial Times, we're gonna have our weekend festival in Kenwood House here in London, where I'm calling in from. And my plan was to have a Eurovision song AI contest, where you cheer on your favorite computers for computer generated music. Uh, that will happen in 2021 once lockdown is over and if Australia is allowed to join the Eurovision Song Contest, I'm sure our American colleagues can join the Eurovision Song AI Contest. So please bring your computers and support them as much as you can. For me, uh, Will Page, former Chief Economist at Spotify for eight years and prior to that, uh, six years as Chief Economist at the Performing Rights Society. So for the students on the call, very important, a balance of rights user and rights holder, frontline experience that I can draw from. Uh, you heard about uh, blockchain, just real briefly on that. My personal position on blockchain is I don't think it's the solution for the problem the music industry has. No disrespect to advocates of blockchain, but I think what that presentation misses is what we should have done in 2003. And what we need to do now is build a global repertoire database. A blockchain solution would be a second best solution. One thing that blockchain can't deal with, in my opinion, is disputes. And in the music industry metadata, there is truckloads of disputes. And that's a challenge. Now, being positive, we have the Music Licensing Committee, uh, one of our other colleagues mentioned. We have Sound Exchange. In 10 years' time, those two parties could merge and build that GRD, but it's not before time. Um, so it's interesting to think about the pros and cons of blockchain. But for the students, I think a key point is it works when dispute levels are low, it doesn't work when dispute levels are high. And then the other two points I really wanted to dig up on um, were the first presentation on data, being you know, primarily you know, heavily involved in the creation of some of Spotify's data tools and explaining them to a wider audience. And then secondly, on Josh's point about uh, catalog. So the big point I wanted to make about data is how it changes the narrative. Now in that presentation from the University of Miami, you heard a reference to city level data. And I wanna give an example of that. Um, in city level data, if you have real time granular city level data about where your fans are, why do we still refer to countries? It's a really important point. Um, in the language of the music industry, we fail to move on with the dashboards that we've got in our hands, on our phones, in our desktops. So are you big in Germany? Wrong question. Are you big in Hamburg, Bremen and Dusseldorf? The right question, because you're not big in Munich and you're nowhere in Berlin, so don't tour there. 
Um, one quick example to really hammer this point home. In 2015, I was working with the band Radiohead, um, who had worked with in the past. And this story is public. It should never have been made public, but I'll cite it anyway. And I was saying, you know, we want to get your album on Spotify. And they were saying, well, we don't want to put the album on Spotify. I said, well, we have all this data. We said, we don't need all your data. I said, we even have city level data. And they said, we know where our top cities are. I said, where are your top cities? And they said, it's obvious, London, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Paris, Amsterdam, it's where we do our stadiums. So it took 34 seconds to flip an Apple Mac open and show that their number one city was Santiago, Chile. Three of the top five cities were in Latin America. Lima was number two in Peru. I mean, I didn't even know that Spotify had launched in Peru at that point. The irony being that the journalist that wrote that story said, since interviewing Will Page, I have noticed that Radiohead have added tour dates in Latin America to their global tour, which makes me ask, where's my 20%? Still, you get the value of data, but also the value of changing the language from country to city. If you have city level data, repeat 10 times, stop referring to countries. That's past tense. Then lastly, just to talk about Josh Friedlander's comments uh, about catalog, I think that's a relevant point. I mean, in short, what Josh was saying is, Instead of monetizing the transaction, we now monetize the consumption downstream. And again, a case study which is public, and I'll make sure that your university gets all the links for this. Uh, I did a big case study with the incredible rock band Imagine Dragons, a really fantastic rock band, one of the biggest touring bands in the world. And the reason why is kids love them as well as parents, which means you sell four tickets as opposed to one. Clever economics there. And what I showed with Imagine Dragons was I took the definition of catalog, which is 18 months long. 18 months after the release of an album, you become a catalog. 18 months since the record was put out, we call you the catalog and we hand you off to the bargain bin. An antiquated rule that dates back to Meatloaf in 1991, the fact that the entire American population was replacing their vinyl collections with CDs, meant the entire American population replaced Bad Out of Hell, released in 1977, with a CD of it. And the chart company said, gee, we've got to get Meatloaf off the top spot in the chart because that's an old record. And they said, if you're more than 18 months old, you don't qualify for charts, you are therefore a catalog. And that's how they got Meatloaf on the top of the chart. It's so crazy we have this antiquated rule still influencing the business today. So back to Imagine Dragons, what I wanted to see was how well did they do in the first 18 months and how well did they do in the second 18 months? And what I learned there was that Imagine Dragons did three times as many streams in the second 18 months than they did in the first. And it was great that in the article, uh, Gary Kelly from Universal went on record and said, in month 17, we were going to drop the band. The numbers weren't adding up, didn't turn out like we hoped, and we thought this was a past tense. We said, no, rather than be a sprinter, let's be a marathon runner and stick this one out. And they did. And had they dropped the band, they would have dropped the second biggest rock band in the history of Spotify, second only to Coldplay. So it just shows how, again, don't refer to countries, refer to cities, don't refer to catalog, refer to the lifetime value of a stream, how the lexicon of the music industry really has to catch up. And for students watching, that's a really important point is when you're reading articles or following books on the subject, just ask whether the language is keeping pace with the business, because I see this problem all the time. Um, I'll wrap up there because I'm really keen to take questions. But again, thank you so much for the presentations and the, the previous speakers and thanks for the invitation. Okay, well, thanks, Will, for some really great comments on all the presentations and a few um, number of good new ideas as well. So I've been um, monitoring the chat and there have been a lot of questions and even some discussion there. Um, one theme I've gathered from the chat um, is a number of people asking about the effect of all this new uh, data analysis um, and uh, whether it disadvantages independent artists or people who are um, you know, kind of on their own and don't have a team of specialists, are they being shut out um, to somehow um, putting a burden that's gonna you know, tilt music to more big mainstream acts that can afford to have a team uh, behind them that uh, will kind of empower them with this advantages, these advantages the data gives. And, um, Kind of a related question, um, Mark Gray noted in a, a chat comment that different platforms gather different data for their own purposes. These are private businesses. Yes, they make nice tools available to artists, but the particular data they track is stuff that they gather 
to sell ads or other things that they're interested in that they may not be providing all the data that particular artists want. Um, and so I guess I would like to ask all the panelists um, your thoughts. Uh, Will, you mentioned the idea of a global repertoire database as something that could happen down the road, but we don't have yet. Um, what would be, so first of you know, a few questions about that. Should we have a global repertoire business? Who should build us? Is this something the government should force or should we wait for industry to work out on its own? Uh, and are there any disadvantages in making more data available in a more centralized way um, that we need to think about if we were to, to have a more direct kind of top-down uh, approach to, to forcing more disclosure of data? You want me to take that one? Sure. Uh, okay, so real brief, we're jumping around quite a few questions there. So I'll pick one and hand it back to the other panelists to tackle. On the Global Repertoire Database, for students watching, it's important to cite where they can get relevant reading. And I published a paper 10 years ago called ECADonomics, E-C-A-D-onomics, which was to learn from the Brazilian model of collective licensing. Strange to think that if you wanted to find order, you'd look at Brazil, but it's a surreal and very spectacular model of licensing they have there. And um, essentially what ECAD does is if you're a television company or a radio company, you have to have one lunch with one body, the ECAD, the Federal Reserve Bank of Copyright. And underneath the ECAD, you have all the membership societies for songwriters, artists, labels, and publishers. So rather than America, where only in America can you have more than one collecting society, ASCAP, BMI, CISAC, and GMR, everywhere else has got a natural monopoly, you have competition there. Plus all the labels, they have the uber, uber monopoly, which is very similar to how you might regulate utilities. In Britain, we had British Telecom open reach lay the copper pipe network for the internet. And then you had competition for the final mile, as we called it, to provide internet services to the home. So I just want to say on the GRD, there's a lot you can learn from the ECAD model. That paper's in plain English. It's very simple to understand. And just how would you stru structure from a blank sheet of paper, a natural monopoly to manage all the copyright? The best person to ask who owns a child is his mother. And you need a GRD database to answer that question. One footnote, then I'll hand it back to you. Two weeks after publishing that paper, and I was really proud of that work, uh, the, la la the board of ECAD went to jail on corruption charges, so I started getting affiliated with Brazilian gangsters. That wasn't my intention. Uh, I explained to my mum. I, you know, I just wrote the paper. I didn't speak to these people. But uh, just to be clear, corruption is rampant in these types of models. But still, look at the industrial organization that's behind them. And I'll ask, you know, why do you have two parties doing the job when one could do it as well? Why do you have an ASCAP dinner celebrating songwriters and a BMI dinner celebrating songwriters? Those dinners cost money, money that could have been paid to the songwriters if we only had one. I want the students to think about that. So I'd like to get our other panelists to weigh on this, the, the general question of making more centralized and perhaps forced disclosures of data to make um, it available in a one place and um, as well suggesting either through the particular model he's talking about or, or in some other form, um, what would you think about that? In, um, are there downsides? Well, the centralization, one thing it will do is it will exacerbate uh, folks left out. Like, let's say, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with Apple Music uh, because Apple has a reputation where they try to be, compared to some other large platform players, relatively pro-privacy. That's, that's one of the things they, 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 they say about themselves. It's important to sell their iPhones. Uh, Google, less so. So I might be happy to opt into an Apple Music and not into a Google. And if there's been if there's a decision made at time two to pull my data in, that could be a problem for me as a consumer. It could expose me to, to some level of risk. One of the difficulties of, 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 of centralization or aggregation is if all the data is in one place, it's easier to hack. We imagine security higher, but also you know hacking higher. So if there's a question of, of haves and have nots for data, you create a bigger target. I talked about that a little bit in a paper from the Google book era from about 10 years ago. Um, unfortunately, did not get looped in with Brazilian gangsters, so not nearly as interesting a story as Wells. Um, but that's a concern, right? The, the repurposing of data, and one thing about competition is I can at least opt into the platform that I think does better for me as a consumer, perhaps better for me as an artist, and that's not necessarily an option in a natural monopoly sort of situation. 
I'd love to chime in. Um, I think we have to make a distinction between what I'll call master data versus transactional data. So, you know, when we talk global repertoire data, we're talking about master data, and I don't mean master in the record company sense of the word. I mean, it's, it's, it's identifying data, it's disambiguation data, it's information that says, essentially, it's, it's the credits, right? It's, this is the recording, this is the record company, this is the artist. Um, and by the way, some of the challenges of those credits is they change. Um, recordings get bought and sold by record companies and soda, soda catalogs of songs. But you have master data, which um, is what the, the Global Repertoire Database Project was, a, was about. Um, and, you know, there is a, a certain subset of that that is, um, I think, harmless in terms of being public. Um, and, and it's, you know, having it be public is very beneficial, um, you know, to so many things. And, and I think in my own personal opinion, you know, that's why the, the, the MLC's data is mandated by law to be public. That's different than transactional data. So transactional data is about, you know, who streamed it, when they streamed it, where they streamed it. That's different. And I think, um, I don't know that anybody's ever asked the question or that we need to about whether that would be um, global in the sense that it's already the case that these services share their, their, a lot of their data with um, companies like Chartmetric, you know, um, and, and SoundScan, Nielsen, and a lot of other um, software, too, which I talked about earlier today. Um, they already feed usage data to those kinds of services to then offer up some kind of service to an artist or an artist manager or a label or a publisher who wants to see that data um, all combined into one place. So I think, um, you know, usually when we talk about global globalization of a, a centralization, um, I usually, I interpret that to mean we're talking about master data, not um, transactional data. Um, and so I just want to make that distinction for, for the students and others listening who may just be thinking all data is the same. Um, there's some pretty key differences that make the conversation, you know, kind of go in two different directions. Can I add something to this, uh, this discussion of, of data? Because uh, I think we had some very interesting conversations with consumers about how they were thinking about this data. And we've talked about a couple of different pieces here. We've talked about the, the master data, about the recording. Um, you know, Sirona, I think you're pointing out the transactional data versus um, Jake, what you're talking about, I think, is where we're starting to get into the personal data. And when we were speaking to consumers, they actually were pretty clear about the difference. And they definitely saw um, there was a big difference between how they viewed dealing with transactional data versus dealing, and they didn't use those exact words, but how they used to talk about transactional data versus personal data. And I think there was a line there. Um, if we think about the transactional data, you know, that's the data that lets a listener say, I like this artist. And then a service comes along and says, hey, you should also listen to this. Or you listen to this artist, their tickets go on sale next week and here's their merch shop and people, I've been looking for that vinyl, you know, I want to, I want to get that. So consumers definitely see and fans definitely see the value in sharing some transactional data. I'm not saying there isn't a line where it goes too far and there's absolutely sensitivity to personal data. But if we're talking about what am I interested in, I think consumers do get that if I'm, I'm sharing something, but I'm also getting something back. Um, when we get to the personal data, maybe they don't know if they're getting something back, but certainly for the, for recommendation engines, um, for getting those other levels of connection, uh, I think it was surprising the degree to which they were knowledgeable about it and open to it. As I think about, um, uh, everything has been well said and I was really focused on Serona's, um, contribution and also thinking about Jake's uh, being the skunk at the at the uh, picnic um, and it's really critically important to always focus on the different aspects. I also teach info privacy law and so that's a really important distinction. So I just echo the sentiments of focusing not all data is the same. Um, therefore, it doesn't all have the same value, but the um, the level playing field of even getting past what I put in the chat about things as simple as the orphan works problem and people after, after one licensing deal, we don't know who's in control of it. That has dramatic impact on the ability of reclaim right, uh, reclaiming rights and uh, some of uh, automating some of those functions. I know the music industry didn't want to do that. And there was a lot of wrangling 
even around that language going into uh, 1976 and beyond. But the idea of having that minimal viable data um, to be able to identify specific aspects, you know, in the sense that you would have in liner notes of old, and but the important information about licensing then translates into empowering artists to be paid downstream, um, and those who um, participated on the upside and the front side being able to participate in downstream revenue opportunities. When you, the good faith participant can more easily identify who uh, is attached to a project. Okay, great. Um, a related set of questions I've been seeing also asks about um, disputed data. And I guess, Will, you brought that up about uh, um, you know, dis potential disadvantage of blockchain is it doesn't allow for disputes over um, who owns something. So I'm curious if, you, if, uh, if this is something that you th um, panelists think we should have uh, more law on or maybe some new legal mechanisms to uh, rather than relying on private companies to set up whatever private process they have. It's not necessarily going to be transparent um, and also won't be um, as accessible, perhaps. Um, should should the, the government or, or some other um, perhaps industry consortium work towards sort of having a centralized process or, or not necessarily centralized, but some sort of more structured means uh, to handle these kinds of disputes? If I could jump in with... Oh, is that to Will? Please go first, Tanya. Oh, just uh, briefly, uh, because your point is well made about the issue reg uh, regarding disputes and it cannot be lost. I spent a lot of time trying to work through that very problem um, in a paper about cross-border disputes and different projects in the blockchain space working on that. Uh, some decentralized autonomous organizations using tokens as a means of voting up or down, adopting some of the work that has already been done just in the digital space. And I mean, it's the same conversation, just a different technology. So we have all of these conventions and treaties and uh, things at the UN level uh, to say what rules and regulations might be used in terms of the enforcement of uh, cross-border disputes. Can a decentralized, can a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization through the use of very sophisticated, a very sophisticated web of smart contracts um, provide the very method and means by maybe adopting some things that uh, are already operating in the digital space in the unique way that it's not one centralized party um, that is uh, voting or deciding, but it is a group of participants voting up or down. There are a host of problems with that because of the differences in um, legal regimes. That's just a host of, of issues, but that is not a new conversation. It's just a new can we leverage this technology in a way that gets us there? The answer might not be, may be no, but a lot of really interesting projects are working in that space in order to resolve that question. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Great. Will, did you want to get on this? Yeah, on disputes, I just wanted to give an American audience a very good example of something happening in Britain, which I noticed many, many years ago, but it's it's with students in a room to think about contracts and incentive design. I think that's a really good avenue to explore when you discuss disputes, uh, especially for economic-based students that are on this, this conference as well. And um, we have in the UK, the Mechanical Copyright Protection Society, a very, really sexy acronym, MCPS. It is the equivalent of Harry Fox with the exception of A, it works, and B, you don't get clobbered with class action lawsuits. So quite important distinction between Harry Fox there. Um, I'm not bitter, I just got sued. But with MCPS, I noticed something very interesting there way back in 2011-12, long before streaming took off. You know, CDs were cratering, downloads weren't filling the gap, the business and mechanical copyright was going bankrupt. You had to administer it, there's less to administer, commission was fixed, revenues were falling, you have a kind of credit crunch situation. And I noticed that the MCPS had advertised for six full-time roles to basically clear out their black box. That was, they were going to invest in a time of crisis in staff, new headcount, to work out who owned unattributable works. I asked the chief executive for the MCPS, what's going on? You're firing people left, right, and center, but now you're hiring people to clear out your black box. This is counterintuitive. And he said, if you look at the way we're designed, we can only get paid when we find out who that envelope is supposed to be addressed to. Until we find that person, it's escrowed, and we can't touch it. So it paid the MCPS to hire a headcount 
to clear out the black box because of the way the organization was designed. There was no, let's just float it out on analogies or dump it into a central distribution pot, which we know many parties in the music industry are guilty of. Their incentive design was, in my opinion, genius. Until you work out who damn well owns that song, you ain't sending it out and you ain't getting paid for sending it out. And it's just a fascinating example of how you can introduce incentives to the contract to reduce the number of disputes. Okay, well, we are about out of time. Did um, no one had any final thoughts on that last point? I guess um, I will thank the panelists uh, for their presentations. There were some questions also about um, sharing the slides and I believe the organizers will be making that available on the uh, conference website. So uh, for those of you listeners who are interested, um, you can look for those uh, hopefully uh, coming soon. Um, but thank you all for uh, tuning in and for very illuminating presentations and a good thorough discussion of this topic. Great, thanks, Sean. Thanks for running an excellent panel. Uh, just, I warned everyone we'd get into the weeds and we did, but I think our panelists did an excellent job of keeping it accessible still, even though quite a lot of good information. And yes, we'll work with the panelists to either have their slides available on our website or direct you to links at their websites where you can get the slides and more because many of our panelists have uh, just great information on their own websites. So we'll get that up. Now it's time for a break until noon. At noon, we come back for artist management and the business of music. And so we'll tune off until then and look forward to seeing you all back at noon. Thanks again, Sean and all the panelists. Thank you.